Welcome to another episode of the Your Longevity Blueprint podcast. Today, my guest has amazing credentials. Ryan Bentley is an MD, PhD, DC, and has established himself as a visionary, dedicated educator, and physician. Board certified in both family medicine and chiropractic, Dr. Bentley also holds a PhD in biomedical sciences with a specific focus on photobiomodulation, and we're going to get into that today. His academic achievements are just the tip of the iceberg. His real passion lies in helping those plagued by chronic and debilitating conditions, which hinder their ability to fulfill their goals in family, community, and beyond. What sets Dr. Bentley apart is his relentless pursuit of knowledge and commitment to delivering the finest care possible. He invests considerable time in researching the most advanced and effective treatments, emphasizing the body's natural ability to heal and regenerate for optimal functionality. His goal transcends the mere practice of medicine. He aims to develop tools and educational resources for both patients and physicians. These resources are designed to establish objective, measurable systems and protocols for achieving peak health. He's described as one of the brightest leaders in the field of preventative lifestyle and regenerative medicine. Dr. Bentley specializes in complex medical problem solving. His innovative approach has made him a national figure particularly through his engaging seminars and the publication of his influential books, Vessels That Thrive, Choosing a Lifestyle of Health, Healing, and Faith, and Sex, Lies, and Cholesterol. Moreover, Dr. Bentley has leveraged his extensive research background. I'm going to just read that again. Um, Moreover, Dr. Bentley has leveraged his extensive research background to delve into gastrointestinal health, contributing to the formulation of probonics, one of the world's leading probiotics. His latest endeavor includes the groundbreaking IGY product line, We'll have to talk about that. His expertise on these subjects is widely accessible with valuable insights available on, I don't even know how to say that, humarian.com. Is that right? Yeah, humarian.com. Yeah, I should yep. have I should have reread this ahead of time. That's okay. Uh, on humarian.com and bentleymd.com, where readers, viewers, and listeners can benefit from his profound knowledge and experience. Dr. Bentley's holistic approach to medicine, combined with his dedication to education and innovation, makes him a pivotal figure in shaping the future of health and healing. Okay, well, let's talk about all that. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Dr. Bentley. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> I initially brought you on the show to talk about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We met last October at a conference, but little did I know how much we could talk about. So before we maybe get to HBOT, I want to hear your story, how you became such an expert in photobiomodulation and hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and honestly, how you have all these amazing credentials. So there's got to be a story behind that. So share with our listeners where this began. (laughs) So it, it actually began. So, you know, my path was going into medicine and I played football in college, broke my low back got what's called spondylolisthesis and Mm. my back's still broken, but I was told I was going to have rods and screws put in my spine. Uh, Studying for my MCAT, had shooting pain down both my legs on a fluke, went to a chiropractor and the guy got the pain out of my legs. And he's like, look, your your back's still broken, but you can go a long time and maybe the surgery won't be as barbaric by the time you actually need surgery, but you can go a long time without ever needing surgery if you keep fit and keep your core and be able to bend over and play with your kids one day. And here I am 19 years old, and I was also helping with some validation studies at Indiana University when I had transferred there after I stopped playing football. Um, I transferred to Indiana University, and I was doing validation studies with regards to the Women's Health Initiative um, on equine Mm -hmm. estrogens. And Mm -hmm. here it was causing increased uterine uh, growth in our rats. And I'm like, how can I give this? It's approved already. But I didn't understand the scientific process. I didn't understand validation studies, didn't understand how bad equine estrogens were, thought that's what estrogens really were, all those different things that go with it. So I had this moral dilemma yeah. and I was like, huh, this guy got pain out of my back. Uh, he read the MRIs, looked at the x-rays, does some physical therapy, manual medicine, no drugs, no therapy or no surgery. I'm like, hey, all right, why not? So I pivoted and went into chiropractic initially. Sure. And In that time, I was enthralled with understanding the science of things and not really philosophy. Um, And then got out, practiced for about eight years, um, worked with Indiana University with the sports medicine team, had a private practice in Bloomington, Indiana, which led to working with moms and dads and their young athletes as well, as well as professional athletes. And that led to uh, me talking with moms and dads about nutrition on their own issues. And then Next thing you know, my practice starts turning into kind of a lifestyle medicine, nutrition type thing, working with people with type 2 diabetes and obesity and just fixing their lifestyle. And then I had a come to Jesus moment. Good friend of mine passed away, left three kids behind. We were just hanging out the month before. And I was like, 
I'm never home. I'm leaving at six in the morning, coming home at nine at night. I thought that was being a husband and a dad and providing for the family, just built our home. And I was like, God, I don't want to live for all this. And um, sure enough, um, I felt led to sell my practice, sell my home. And I moved to Holland, Michigan and went into hiding and basically worked out. I took a sabbatical sort of thing or. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, 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 were, I, I created an online platform at the time that I was training uh, doctors in nutrition and blood work and understanding how to stratify the blood work in a way. So I kind of did that. So I was the dad at every cupcake party at every little school function that was there. I was riding the bikes with the kids, uh, that type of thing. And then I was had launched um, Sexualizing Cholesterol and I was speaking on heart disease down in Florida. And this is probably 2011, 12 ish, somewhere around there. And I was speaking on heart disease and this doctor walked up to me afterwards and he goes, you're just a chiropractor. I go, yeah. And he goes, you need your medical degree. I was like, look, I sold my practice. So I had a life. I said, there's no chance I'm going back to school. And he's like, look, I'm a dean of a medical school. We got a bridge program for healthcare professionals. Um, and we also have a PhD program. I'm like, yeah, certainly not doing any of that. And, um, <laughs> you know, uh, interesting journey, but long story short, after that, seven months later, off I apply, go back to school, do my MD, PhD under George Einstein, George Einstein at the Einstein Medical Institute. He did uh, a lot of photobiomodulation, had a grant with the U.S. military, um, it's actually Albert Einstein's second cousin, believe it or not. And they look identical if you Google him on uh, the internet. Um, <laughs> it's pretty interesting. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Uh, so that's how I got exposed to photobiomodulation and okay. with regards to whole blood. And then that uh, led, to, led to oxygen-based therapies and ozone-based therapies and using these modalities to help people facilitate healing uh, in the most fundamental way, I believe, all the way at the level of the cell. So that is a long convoluted way of how I got to where I did finishing everything school wise in 2015, uh, finished up PhD work in 16, went into residency in 17, uh, got my permanent medical license in 19, and then uh, was uh, voted to be chief resident. So I stayed on, uh, got board certified uh, in, in family medicine, as well as uh, served as chief, re chief resident as well. And now you have, do you have one clinic or do you have several clinics? Uh, no, I have one clinic. One clinic, okay. I, Where you're offering all of these therapies we're going to talk about, correct? Correct, yep. So let's get into those. So for our listeners, we have had no one come on talking about hyperbaric oxygen, also known as kind of HBOT. That's the abbreviation we may mention today, just for the listeners. So explain, obviously these therapies excited you. So kind of tell the listeners yeah. what HBOT is and kind of how it works at the cellular level for overall health and disease recovery. Okay. Um, so when it comes to hyperbaric oxygen therapy, it is pressurized air at 100% oxygen. So there, there are different types of chambers out there. There are soft chambers that can't get to high levels of pressurization. And so you got to think about at the very fundamental aspects of life. Most people don't understand this, but the moment that the sperm hits the egg, there's a flash of light. Light is a form of energy. Energy, we know it, with physics, is neither destroyed, um, and it, it, just, it just changes form. And so light is a form of energy, and that's when we become that self-healing, self-regulating system to become what we are today. And that is initially is that zinc spark. That's what it's actually called, is the zinc spark when that sperm hits the egg. And then we become this live being. And the first thing when we are brought into the world, we take that breath of air and that is oxygen. And that supplies our, AT, our, our mitochondria, which is what make our ATP, which is our energy currency. Mm -hmm. So I always think about um, working all the way at the level of the mitochondria and making ATP um, so our body has more money to spend, so to speak. And when people are in a deficit, they can't heal because it takes a lot of energy to heal. Sure. So imagine, you know, when you're sick, you know, no yeah. one feels great. They don't want to go help thy neighbor and shovel the driveway when they have the flu. Their immune system is working overtime, taking all their energy and reserves, focusing on the immune system and trying to help combat whatever infection they've got going on. So with that said, we live in a society of people with chronic diseases that are due to lifestyle diseases and choices that we're making because we're not fueling our body appropriately, right? 
So without fueling our body appropriately, we can't heal appropriately over time. Our body can compensate for so long till you start to get symptoms to manifest. And that's when your check engine light comes on. Yep. You can put duct tape over it and cover up that check engine light and say, oh, nothing to see here. But the problem is still there. And so that's where some people will take a medication to mask the pain. But it's like I tell people, I say, look, if you step on a nail and you got a nail in the bottom of your foot, I could pull it out and fix the problem. Or I can inject you with lidocaine and keep numbing it up. <laughs> you choose. And uh, so that's kind of how I look at everything. So when it comes back to hyperbaric oxygen therapy, when our mitochondria are making energy, when oxygen is present, you make 36 to 38 ATP for every sugar molecule that you have when combined with oxygen. When you're in anaerobic metabolism, so anaerobic is without oxygen. So mm -hmm. if someone is going to go get and sprint around your, your home, that's more anaerobic. Long distance running is more aerobic. You're in a fat burning mode, that type of thing. So in anaerobic metabolism, you make two ATP. When which someone would is, you rather have? <laughs> which would you rather have? So that's like, I, it's like me saying, if I give you a dollar, if you give me a dollar, I'm going to give you $2 back. Or you give me a dollar and I'm going to give you, let's just say 38 dollars back. I'll take that. I'll take that. Yeah. Or, and then you even dive into nutritional ketosis. And when the body burns ketones, you make 96 ATP. So that's where our bodies have to be flexible to be able to burn fat for energy in the form of ketones or burn glucose. But you have to be flexible, but everybody's so dominant in this mm -hmm. high carbohydrate. Now they're inflamed. Now they're in this anaerobic metabolism, getting a dollar and getting $2 back or giving a dollar, getting $2 back as opposed to 36 to 38. So then when they're injured or they're ill, they can't heal. Right. They don't have that reserve. Yeah. They don't have that reserve. And so when it comes to hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and so that's, that's the principle in my mind of how I pick what type of modalities I really want to use. Because I really want to work all the way down at the fundamental principle of it. I want to fix things that are, if a dam breaks, we could go sandbag every home or you go fix the dam. So I really like to fix the fundamentals of the dam and help people get over that edge, if you will. Right. So that's where hyperbaric oxygen really came in, because if you've got chronic inflammatory conditions, you got lower extremity edema. You got poor wound healing. You don't have proper blood flow. You don't have blood flow. You can't heal because you can't get the nutrients there. You can't get the oxygen there. You can't get the ATP to be produced in order for the body to heal. Sure. Okay. So that's how, you know, uh, people with non-healing wounds heal in hyperbaric oxygen therapy, because regardless of where the blood flows, because everybody, now that we've had COVID, if I could say that word, um, you, you, everybody knows the pulse oximeter. Just about everybody and a brother has one at home watching their oxygen saturation. Well, that oxygen saturation is how much oxygen is on your red blood cell. Well, it's only going to go where the red blood cell gets delivered. So let's say you've got an area where there's no blood flow. Well, that tissue in the, the interstitial fluid around it is only saturated at maybe 3% at most. When you're in hyperbaric oxygen therapy, at 100% oxygen, at at least two atmospheres of pressure, you saturate that area of 3% is now at 100%. Amazing. Yep. So, yeah. So even if the, let's say the highway is blocked, which is the blood vessel, it's like you had a stroke, you know, because they show a lot of benefit for people getting hyperbaric oxygen therapy post-stroke, because wherever that stroke is, you're going to get decreased blood flow. But we have what's sure. called the watershed area, which is the other surrounding area that aren't going to get that blood. Sure. Now that tissue is going to die and you start to get aphasia or you have motor dysfunction, but they know that if you go into a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, it'll saturate, even though the blood isn't flowing there, it will saturate the surrounding tissues and keep that tissue alive and actually create neuro regeneration and for the, those nerves to regenerate and to regrow. Um, and so that's where it's really important. But I always tell people, I said, it's also important to know that we have all the micronutrients that your body needs. B12 is very important for nervous tissue healing. So I don't want to just throw someone in a hyperbaric oxygen cha chamber without knowing what their B12 is because they can't have neuroregeneration because that's a huge component and a cofactor to make new nerves. Sure. So that's that in a nutshell. It's a very simple thing. You go into the chamber. Um, I got I got a couple videos on it on my YouTube channel. 
Um, you can go to the website um, on my Vitalis Health website where there's a couple of videos where I talk about that. And I also have one on YouTube where I talk about the spark of life as well. But the whole the whole principle behind all of it is, is really helping the body to facilitate healing in the best way possible, making sure because our body runs off of vitamins, minerals, proteins, fats, water, and oxygen. Mm -hmm. And it's getting it in the right amounts at the right dosage at the right time to overcome whatever hurdle you have. And so some people, uh, there's over 110 different indications worldwide for hyperbaric oxygen. In the United States, the FDA allows for 14 indications. And that's like um, diabetic Probably, yeah, yeah. Wounds, uh, people with carbon monoxide poisoning because it'll kick off the carbon monoxide because the pressure of oxygen. So people go in on a respirator on life support and they come out walking out, which is crazy. Pretty cool to see that. Yeah. Uh, most people are familiar with hyperbaric oxygen therapy when it comes to um, scuba diving injuries where they come up the bends. They come up from the from their des descent too quickly because yep. as you go under think about a soda can when you open up a soda can it goes psh, and then and now the bubbles come up well that carbon dioxide is compressed inside that uh, can in the fluid although you relieve that pressure and now that gas bubble comes up so when you are uh, scuba diving nitrogen you're breathing, you're, you're breathing uh, normal air, which is like 21% oxygen with some nitrogen and a, a mixture of gas. Um, so when they come out of their dive too quickly, that nitrogen can create a air bubble and lead to what's called an air embolism. And so what yeah. they do with hyperbaric oxygen is they put you back into a chamber, compress that gas again, and you're at 100% oxygenation. So you can't get the bends coming out of a hyperbaric oxygen chamber too quickly because it's 100% oxygen. There's no nitrogen to do that. So there's a difference in that aspect, but that's what most people is usually, they think about it with scuba diving, um, but there's multiple indications. So uh, neurodegenerative diseases, we look at things like Alzheimer's, uh, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of different things that are still in investigation, but you're not going to get these multi-centered, uh, huge numbers uh, because it, it's not there's not a big money maker for someone to invest a ton of money to do all these different sure. researchers or research uh, projects based off of that. So, but you can, and it all kind of started of using it for these other indicators when someone was getting treated for a scuba diving injury and all of a sudden some of their wounds were healing. Um, they would have other issues with say dementia and all of a sudden these things are getting better. Um, so that's kind of how it's evolved over the years, but hyperbaric oxygen therapy has been around for, you know, 60 plus years, easy. Um, and it's just become more and more clinical and people are starting to have more access to it now, besides just the 14 indicators that you can get at a hospital and have it covered by insurance companies. Can you explain the difference between the soft and the hard chamber? And then you were kind of alluding to the atmospheres. So kind of the difference in like how pressurized, I don't know if I'm saying this right, the soft versus the hard chamber kind of can be to kind of differentiate those. Yeah. Cause you were also kind of alluding to scuba diving, which is essentially kind of what HBOT is, it's like going scuba diving, right? You're like going under pressure. Um, yeah. So you can better explain that. <laughs> yeah. So as you, as you, so we live on the earth's level. So that's one atmosphere of pressure. Hard chambers are allowed to, ab you're able to pressurize the inside of that chamber up to three atmospheres of pressure. And that really compresses the gas into your tissues and saturates it at a really, really high level to penetrate deep into tissues and go where blood isn't flowing. And it'll stay like that for a good six hours at least afterwards. And then, and that's where people typically do hyperbaric oxygen therapies in the heart chambers in succession. Sure. And so you can increase the amount of oxygenation 20 times the amount of what you have at atmosphere pressure when you're using 100% oxygen in a heart chamber. So again, it's all about kind of the dose it's 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 a dose response the soft chambers are by definition because the in definitions are changing but by definition a hyperbaric oxygen chamber is something that goes above 1.4 atmospheres of pressure and so a soft chamber by law in the united states uh from what i've read and understand uh someone may take me to task on the details of it but usually is like up to 1.3 atmospheres of pressure is a soft chamber. Uh, so you get 
less concentration. You'll feel your ears, the equalization yeah. of your ears. So just like when someone is going up in a plane and they pressurize the cabin, you feel your ears kind of pop or you're going into a valley in between mountains or you're coming up, you'll feel a change in pressures. Okay. So a soft chamber, most people use an oxygen concentrator, meaning they're taking the 21% oxygen that we breathe, concentrating it in a little device and pumping it into a soft chamber. I believe that there are benefits with the soft chambers, but not for these hard neurological degenerative things um, to get to the capacity and the non-heal wounding issues that people have. Um, I believe that they can be a benefit. I think they're great post-recovery after hard workouts, or if you're an NFL guy and you're getting beat up on Sundays and then you want to recoup, I think they're great things to use for things like that. But if you're trying to overcome a hard injury, um, something that you've had done surgically, uh, a lot of people, plastic surgeons will recommend using it pre and post. There are some biological dentists that will use it uh, with cavitations, infections. Um, I use uh, the hard chambers for people with chronic Lyme disease. So chronic Lyme disease, you know, it becomes so hard to treat with antibiotics because it's a, it's a facultative anaerobe. It's a spirochete that doesn't like oxygen. So it goes into the nooks and crannies of the human hides. frame. Yeah. Yeah. It hides from the oxygen. So that's why people are getting benefit with the hard chambers with chronic Lyme disease, because it will saturate the tissue with oxygen and Lyme disease does not like the spirochete doesn't like oxygen. So it's going to the areas that blood isn't flowing and help and providing with that oxygen to kind of kill it off. But I, I feel like the soft chambers, some people will talk about the dose and they're like, well, if you do longer times in the soft chambers um, and you do it more frequently that you can get a dose equivalent. I don't think we've stratified the research in that aspect to validate that hundred percent, but again, sure. don't get me wrong. I believe soft chambers have their place. I think all things have their place with my my training being a dichotomy, um, having chiropractic where I understand health and wellness and uh, what normal physiology is, and then having medicine, which talks about sickness, disease, and pathology, and also the beauty of bringing a baby into the world. Um, but I find people are in this in-between wasteland where they're mm -hmm. not healthy and well and pointed in that direction as they continue to age. Their needle is pointed towards sickness and disease but they're not a pathology yet. So we don't treat them traditionally, but it's years of dysfunction that lead to disease and pathology. So there's a time and place, you know, it's, you know, goodness, if I have a heart attack, I'm not going to go get adjusted and go take some B12. You know, <laughs> hopefully they uh, put me out as they crack my chest and do whatever they can to keep me alive. Mm -hmm. My goal is to keep me from getting to the point of ever having a heart sure. attack. Sure. And so it's an in-between land. And so that's where with the hyperbaric, I think there is a place for soft chambers. But for me, when someone's trying to overcome disease and pathology, the hard chambers is more where it's at, in my opinion. Thank you. Yep. You kind of already shared a little bit of this, but from your professional experiences, can you share any remarkable cases where hyperbaric oxygen really made a significant difference in patient treatment outcomes? Do you have any specific cases to share? Yeah, I've had a gentleman that had a chronic wound that hadn't healed in probably four years, I would say he had a previous yeah. hip and the skin just continued to open up. It would weep, it would ooze, get really nasty and ugly. And then tried treating it with antibiotics. I sent him to wound care. Um, they did the packing, they did deep probing, um, removed some of the debris. I mean, so we've done all the different traditional things and it just wouldn't heal up. And he did 18 sessions before uh, he, he was a snowbird. And so he did 18 sessions before leaving. And by the time he left, the wound was completely healed up and completely enthralled because he can go get in a pool while he's down basking in the warm weather, um, where here it's uh, cold in Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> it dropped 35 degrees overnight. Yesterday I was outside Same with, with the, the t-shirt. Yeah. yeah. And now we have snow. So yeah. anyways, yeah, we went from like 60, 70s to this morning, driving my son to school. It was like 10 degrees. Yeah. It's just insane. Dropped. It's, it's like, yeah, totally crazy. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that who? that's one case. Yeah, I just sure. got a text yesterday uh, from uh, a medical doctor whose mother has been being treated for chronic Lyme disease for over five years. And we had used some of our oxygen-based therapies. We have a thing that's called EBU full spectrum, which is extracorporeal blood oxygenation and ozonation. Had been doing that. And then when we, and that got her off after the second treatment, we've been able to get her off of all of her. She was on three antibiotics for two years and nine months, uh, was able to get her off all of those antibiotics. And then when we got the hyperbaric uh, oxygen chambers, 
uh, were able to get that. And I just got a text yesterday from the daughter saying, thank you guys so much for giving me my mom back. Um, mm. They're on a vacation right now. Just did an incredible hike yesterday um, up some slippery slopes to see some waterfalls. She's read a book for the first time in five years, uh, things of that nature. Some people with uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, seeing people from um, severe medical trauma to the point of um, dissociation mm. uh, where chronically screaming and screaming until they pass out. And that was their life for a good couple months Wow! Uh, to now back to walking and being functional and still a long road, but to see the changes exponentially. And this is a case where that person is nearing 60 treatments. So it's, you know, the treatments change based off of what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve. And I believe also the overall health of someone as well. So it's kind of that there's an art of it because it's not a, a cookbook. You kind of start with basic protocols, as you know, with anything, you kind of learn a protocol and you kind of take it to that next level based off of your experiences and what you see with people. We have a tendency to you know, it, what works seems to work. So why change it? And then, but then you start integrating and working with people in different capacities and people are at different levels of health status and you have to adjust for that. And that's where the art of medicine comes in. You have listed quite a few good examples of patients who could benefit from HBOT. So you're basically saying any sort of brain or neurologic injury, right? Wounds, of course. Mm -hmm. um, patients with chronic, I love that you keep mentioning this Lyme disease Lyme disease patients, because we have a lot of patients with mold toxicity and chronic infections. So those also, and that, I mean, is this essentially, and we can get to ozone too, but you know, what I, at least what I was kind of trained in is that, you know, giving ozone even is helpful because many, many patients are in the state of kind of decreased oxygen utilization. I'll just never forget in training. They kept saying decreased oxygen utilization, <laughs> which <laughs> ozone and HBOT can help. Correct. So if you're fighting a chronic infection, right? I mean, to support your immune system, you need that oxygen also, right? So I guess I'm kind of talking myself in circles here, but any patients with chronic infections also could benefit, correct? Is that 100%. Okay. And yeah. because one, it helps to increase delivery to get your warriors there, your immune cells to get there because <laughs> you get angiogenesis when you have, uh, it, so there's, when it comes to hyperbaric, I mean, it, we've got studies that show that it turns off inflammatory genes, turns on anti-inflammatory uh, genes, um, and in perfect case, I had a, a patient with, with ulcerative colitis that was really bad, um, that now is uh, nearing remission. Uh, we did 40 sessions currently on vacation. Um, going to be gone for, he's taking a little pause right now. Um, uh, but we did 40 sessions and we got him to the point of traveling. This is a man that was 176 pounds. that got all the way down to 106 pounds to the point that we were doing iron infusions, uh, cause he was just losing so much and yeah. couldn't keep anything in. And, you know, it was in tandem cause I did to get him hospitalized and different things to get things stable, yeah. stable because there's a time and place for that. He was too unstable to just do things on an outpatient basis. But once we got him stable, then we're able to do more of the healing things and capacities. Um, but the, you think about angiogenesis, so it will turn on angio for cells and genesis for the beginning. So you're beginning the development of new blood vessels to areas that didn't previously have sure. blood flow. And so you can help regenerate from that aspect. And that's where some of the things with the neuroregeneration and the chronic wounds and things of that nature. And then you think about chronic infections, they get into these pockets and they get into areas that you can't get great blood flow. So in a lot what about of them, cancer, is this a yay or nay for cancer? So it's in all honesty, it's in my opinion, it's a yay. And a lot of research helps validate that. And I'll tell you why. Because cancer cells, the majority of them um, show that they do fermentation and more like an anaerobic metabolism. So they thrive in the anaerobic metabolism. So they thrive in areas of decreased oxygenation, but want delivery of nutrients to that area. So now you disrupt that cascade by saturating the area with oxygen at 100%, uh, disrupting that. And then you get the person into a state of nutritional ketosis where they're now burning ketones for energy. They don't have the sugar that's available to be burned. So most people with cancer, they understand PET scans and PET scans is radioactive sugar basically yeah. showing the uptake. I just reviewed one this morning for a patient that's getting some treatment right now. And the we had these hot spots uh, for this uh, diffuse B-cell lymphoma 
that she has. And, uh, but their uptake of that sugar was really, really high. So cancer loves sugar and loves more of a fermentation anaerobic metabolism. So now we deprive the cancer cells of sugar. And then Thomas Siegfried wrote a, wrote a book, the metabolic, um, aspects of cancer, metabolic disease of cancer, I think, or cancer is a metabolic disease. That's what it is. Um, so when he goes through that whole research and understanding that whole thing and using some of the stuff from Otto Warburg, uh, who is a Nobel uh, laureate as well, talking about this fermentation and decreased oxygenation. So we increase the oxygen, deprive the cancer cells of the sugar and get more uh, focusing on ketones. And now you can get the body a better edge because then you're also stimulating your immune system in a healthy way that now you can get more natural killer cells, which H bot and increase yeah, off yeah. do. Yeah. So you're just working with the body from an immune standpoint, which is where I think from a traditional medicine standpoint, we're doing really, really well as we're advancing with immunotherapies mm -hmm. and biologics, as opposed to just doing the old tried and true 40 year old uh, data of chemotherapy. Let's play Russian roulette, kill the good cells and the bad cells and see which one lives. But I think as we're getting more targeted therapies towards cellular pathways, <laughs> We're making some ground with regards to things and keeping other host cells uh, more healthy. But I think for me, it's trying to help the body overcome uh, the deficiency that it has, that it can now function at a much higher level. Awesome. Sounds like something everybody needs. Okay. So almost sounds too good to be true. So what are the, any side effects? Or well, and, 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 yeah. yeah. So, uh, so great question. So when it comes to that, the only true uh, contraindication is a pneumothorax, which is a collapsed lung. Um, I have one guy with uh, stage four cancer right now. He's a perfect candidate and also just had a stroke. Uh, mm -hmm. Perfect candidate for this. However, he had a pneumothorax in uh, May of this past year, um, stage four lung cancer, um, which he would do great. Also actinomyces, which is a facultative anaerobe uh, down base and in, into the bases of the lung because of decreased oxygenation into that area. So prime candidate, but also not a prime candidate, the risk reward is not, it isn't there because his lungs aren't stable enough yet. But now that he just had a stroke this past weekend, I just evaluated him earlier this week we start having more of that discussion, you know, of, okay, when time, now, yeah, yeah. When we need to wait, we're not there yet, but you're getting stronger, you're getting better, but we've got other health issues uh, to do it. So again, pneumothorax is the only major real contraindication of absolute contraindication. Borrow trauma, which is ear trauma. So with the eardrums yep. happens about what we call an ear squeeze, uh, which you can get some ear pain because again, you're pressurizing air. If they can't equalize pressure, that's kind of a no-go. So we always make sure uh, that they um, are able to blow down and uh, essentially you know, clear your ears. Like when you're in an airplane and correct. you want your ears to pop, you have to be able to do that. Have to be able to yep. do that. Yep. You don't want people going into a chamber with a sinus infection. So we've got two people right now this week that are actually on pause because they're sick. And we're like, okay, we definitely don't want you coming in. Sure, sure. Um, you know, those types of things. So those are the main contraindications. And you got to think about it. Even some people do that from a longevity standpoint, uh, just maintaining. So, you know, with the longevity blueprint, it's, you know, you're, you're doing things to increase your energy output, your functionality of your body. And so, you know, I do it if we get someone that's sick and I'm on one of my admin days and uh, content creation and writing books and things of that nature. Um, and we got a, per a person that couldn't come in, then whether it be a snowstorm or whatever, yeah. then I'll hop in it, you know? Yeah. Um, now, do but, you take pen and paper in there? Because that's the other, I guess, for the listeners. So obviously with pressurized oxygen, that's flammable. So, well, <laughs> so what can and cannot be taken in the chamber? What are your yes. rules for that? So um, <laughs> we basically tell people, if God doesn't give it to you and we don't give it to you, you can't go in the chamber with it. So, and that's where, because it is um, combustible. So flammable is like gasoline. Oxygen will fuel a fire. So and I should so be saying combustible, not combustible. Flammable? Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep, it's it's combustible. So, um, but you know, now you have 100% oxygen, and now all of of a sudden you create a spark with something. Then, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna 
cause combustion of the materials that are in there. If you got nylon clothing on, that's why we have 100% cotton because it doesn't stay saturated into the tissues, um, things of that nature. You don't go in there with a cell phone. You don't go in there with anything that has a battery. There's certain things that, that are approved. Um, so pacemakers, they've been approved, most of them. So we call, like if a patient has a, a pacemaker, we'll yeah. call, let's say it's Medtronics. I know that they're all good, yeah. but they've been tested up to three atmospheres of pressure and the battery is covered. So with a Dexacom or a Freestyle Libre for these continuous glucose monitors, those are those are okay to go into the chamber with. Um, we do an extra step and we just cover it up with some Tegaderm. People don't want to go into 100% oxygen with petroleum-based stuff on a wound or anything because petroleum getting oxidized can create a chemical burn. So we do a lot of things. We are overboard because I don't want to be a Netflix special or, um, you know, Dateline. Um, so... People that are going to chambers and I see some things that are marketed where people are going in with a nasal cannula and they're going into the chamber in their street clothes and they're on their cell phone. One, I see that too. And I'm like, I don't, that's right. That's not real. In my <laughs> opinion, they're not getting real true hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, and if they are, they're certainly not safe. So they're because, going in, in, in the cotton gown or whatever you're providing, no makeup, so, no hair products, correct. no cell phone yet. If they had their nails done, so we looked at the research and the off-gassing of anything that could be flammable, like getting your nails done 10 hours, then you should be all that so gas. the next should, day, yeah. fine. okay. Yeah, so the next day, dry shampoo, uh, if they do that, you can't do dry shampoo and then come in. Uh, we don't do, we tell them to come in with no makeup, uh, don't, yep. no, don't go get your hair done and spray it with 1980s Aquanet, and so you're an 80s movie, you know? So, um, but we have 100% cotton scrubs um, and everything else in there is cotton. There is a TV mounted on the outside and there are speakers on the inside so people can go in there in silence and just pray, meditate, or they can watch a movie series. Um, so we have Netflix, Hulu and all that. And we have the music or the either yeah, music yeah. Can pumped in, uh, they can watch a movie. So they got time uh, to themselves. Uh, for me, I'm there. What's the duration? Oh, oh, no, sorry. I cut you off. Finish. What oh, that's okay. Uh, so we, we set two hour appointments and that's getting in and getting out because we use the red light therapy with everybody that gets high, high hyperbaric oxygen therapy as well. But we, um, so we plan a two hour appointment. Uh, they come in, that gives them 15 minutes to get ready, get changed, get on the bed. And then we're putting in right at their start time. Takes about 10 to 15 minutes to get to the depth of treatment. The pressure. Depth, sure. The pressure that you're going for. And then with that, you um, are at that depth. We do for about 60 minutes. And then coming out of the chamber is usually 10 to 15 minutes. And sometimes sure. that could be five minutes. It, it depends upon. Um, once you're used to it and acclimated, you, like yeah, how once quick you yeah, can. Once you're yeah. used to it and acclimated, then it's easy peasy and people are able to go in and out without a problem. What about claustrophobia? I've only been in a chamber once and I got to say it was a little, it was my first time, <laughs> but that okay. was a little, and it was a big, I mean, it was a big chamber. I was a little claustrophobic. Are there any tips for helping patients get over that? Yeah. So, and it kind of depends upon the type of chamber. Um, our chambers are a hard shell chamber. That's a clear acrylic on the outside. So the whole tube that they're in is completely clear acrylic. Oh, wow. Tube. Yeah. So Perry Medical makes those, uh, which is what we have. And then also there's uh, Seacrest, which is another company that makes these hard shell chambers with the clear acrylic. So they don't really feel too claustrophobic going in Yeah, that's in there. great. Yeah. Uh, some people, so uh, there's a, you can use some natural products that can kind of help calm people calm down, down. A little bit, yep. uh, beforehand. Um, there's some, uh, milk peptides that can do that. There's like things like ashwagandha that people can take. L-theanine, uh, yeah. L-theanine, sure, GABA, sure. things like that. Uh, some people that are really bad is, might be using a short acting benzodiazepine. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. So, um, but most, we haven't had to do any of that. Uh, most of it is, is, uh, our team. Educating it, the patient and yeah. it's educating, yep. walking them through it. Uh, tell them to just kind of close their eyes and, you know, they're just going to relax and just breathe normally. And that's yeah. all you do. You go into the chamber and you spend time in your thoughts or you watch something entertaining or listen to music and that we pipe in there. And then there's a, a phone that we can talk to them. So they just talk normally and we can hear them on this phone and they can hear us. Um, and that's so great. The, then we pick it up. And so they kind of signal to us like, Hey, um, because they might want the volume up or you could change the temperature in there based on the flow rate of oxygen in and oxygen out of the chamber. So, oh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like you have a yeah great organization there. Good. <laughs> Good uh, we have an incredible team. It's, I'm <laughs> very blessed with the team that we have. It's awesome. I want to move on just a little bit to faith here. So in your view, how does faith influence an individual's approach to health and healing? Like, especially in the context of these sort of, we'll call it a modern medical treatment like HBOT. Oh man, now you're going to get me preaching, girl. (laughs) Go for it. (laughs) So yes, I have spoken at churches on Sunday morning and and (laughs) preached on Sunday morning. So, um, but uh, I'll I'll try to uh, not get to that point, but it's sometimes I just can't help it because it's a huge passion of mine. Um, You know, 72% of Americans claim to be born again Christians at some level or have some level of faith. And fasting is part of every spiritual uh, religious practice uh, basically known to man um, and woman, not being sexist here. Um, But in just about every capacity, you know, fasting is involved there as well. And so not only is it uh, looking at things from that standpoint, but if we go back to my faith and from a Christianity standpoint is our job is to love and serve other people to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And mm. how can we do that if we're fatigued, depressed, and falling ill to chronic lifestyle diseases due to choices that we're making on a daily basis? And some people may not know. Um, you know, I, I remember sitting down across from a lady that was, you know, se- severely morbidly obese, as was her nine-year-old daughter. And the mom was drinking two, two liters of Mountain Dew a day. And then you think about, well, what's that child doing is emulating what the mom's doing, sure. but the mom didn't really have any health education. Sure. Um, so from that standpoint, you know, there's generational things that we think about in the book of Judges and how, you know, the Israelites, when generation removed, didn't realize what God had done, you know. Uh, so you think about that and we think about our generational influences that we have in, in, in people. And we have this one life, this one body that we have to serve our purpose. And each, each of us is a unique individual. We all have purpose. We all have a circle of influence. And the question is, how are we serving that circle of influence? And so mm. when it comes to faith, I really think about it where people get motivated all the time. They do it every New Year's Eve. You know, they get motivated. They're ready to make all these changes, but they're usually for an external stimulus of some sort. Um, I want to look good in my bikini or I want six pack abs for spring break. That's going to be coming in three months. So they hit it really hard. But by January 4th, you know, we got 20. They plus forgot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they've already stopped. But again, it's and it's a, about it's, it's about an internal uh, drive that's bigger than ourselves. And so my goal is really integrating faith in a way that people understand that you need to be inspired. It's not about being motivated. It's about being inspired for something bigger than you. And then that gets you up and serving your purpose, whatever that is. People, I I see people phenomenally thriving in what some uh, professions where people think that, oh, I wouldn't want that job or they, they uh, make fun of the job. And, but yet for someone else, that's their passion. Maybe they have OCD on cleaning, but yet they're able to leave notes or influence and have a conversation or make a place. Um, uh, my kids, they clean my, my two boys. They clean our office. And I said, look, when you're here, this isn't like when I ask you to clean your room. You're coming here as a place that this place is a place that people are loved on, cared for, heard, and they're here to heal. So I don't want to see dust in the corners. I don't want to see dust bunnies. It's it's caring for a place and emulating a level of care that we want to deliver to the person. So they they clean as if they're cleaning for Jesus. Mm-hmm. And they do a phenomenal job. And they they tag team it. We, we have a 4,300 square foot office and they do a great job on it and they, they clean it. But it's finding that purpose and what's their ultimate why? What is their why behind people want to get healthy, but why, why do you care? And and really that comes back to your purpose and your gifts and skills. And everybody has a different set of gifts and skills. And it's, it's honing in on that and finding that and finding where people feel more, most passionate, most fulfilled in doing what they do. And so that's really what I try to help bring out when I'm sitting down with somebody new, my new patient in takes two hours. And it's really stratifying, hearing their story, listening to them, picking up patterns, watching every move. I'm watching their eyes. I'm looking for a deviation in one eye that gets weak over time, thinking of something neurological. I'm looking at their skin. I'm looking at their body language. But ultimately, I'm asking them, well, why? Why, do you, why are you here? Why do you care? You know, and when you, when you really drill, it's not a just, I just want to feel better. Why do you want to feel better? So, and again, I think it's our responsibility. You know, it, it's it's written that, you know, For don't you know that you are the holy temple of God? We are that being, you know, we were bought at a price. 
And so it's, it's fulfilling that timeline that we have here. I don't know. This could be my last conversation. I, I don't know. So how do we fulfill our purpose and leave a legacy with our gifts and skills? And people just need to find their worth as well. And so that's where we find our worthiness. We find our worth in finding a higher purpose and a higher calling for our life in the time that we're here. So that's where health and healing truly yeah. begin. Um, yeah. So that's how, for me, you don't segregate them. It's I, I it's I find it interesting. I did residency in a medical Methodist hospital where in our bylaws we could not pray with a patient. Huh? So I'm like, OK, i um, not saying that I did or didn't pray with people in the emergency department often um, <laughs> and hold hands. Um, but none the, nonetheless, um, you know, I think about that and. It's really where it, it, it's a way for people to connect to something bigger than themselves so they can ride the test of time because you're going to have ups and downs in your health journey. Mm -hmm. And so it's how do we find that inner strength? And again, we'll fail ourselves every time. It's about something bigger than ourselves. And I have to care for myself because I'm sure as heck not going to go to a broke financial advisor either. So I don't really want people coming to a sick doctor that's morbidly obese because I'm eating ding dongs and ho-hos. Now I have a treat periodically, but my treats are treats. Treats are not my staple. <laughs> I eat the things that our body was created to have. Um, but do I have a treat every once in a while? Yeah. But I keep it in check. I'm not going to, uh, on, on that subject really quickly. So I, it wasn't a, what'd was, you eat this morning? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I haven't. I'm on a three day fast right now. So I'm wow. on the end of a three day fast. So wow. I have lunch lunch here with my uh, wife and son here in just a little bit, but wow. um, so we're making the fast. But when I, I think about it, I was a, in a um, small group one time and, you know, it, it, it is written that everything is permissible, you know, with the new Testament and the, the coming of Jesus, that nothing to a man that put a man puts into his mouth is unclean, but we're also not to make our brother or sister fall either. So what's a conviction for one person may not be a conviction for someone else, but the question really is, is the intent. So if I'm going to comfort food because I'm going to create serotonin and make me feel good and beta endorphins that block pain, people are literally eating away their physical and emotional pain and turning to food in times of comfort instead of turning to God first. Well, if you turn to food first, then what are you doing? You're creating idolatry, which edges God out of your life a little bit. And that's not what God likes, but I'm not here to judge and I'm not the one that's judging. That's between <laughs> you and your creator. Yeah, yeah. And he knows your heart, He, you know, in that type of aspect, but people don't realize their habits and what they're doing, they're stressed out. So they go eat comfort food or they got to have their uh, shot of whiskey when they get home to unwind. Mm -hmm. Well, if that becomes a habit, that becomes something and you're edging out God instead of giving your daily stressors and also looking for the opportunities of the daily failures or the daily stressors that happen of how you could turn that into something beautiful, because there's always something to learn. So that's a sorry. good sermon right I'm gonna there. Start, I'm going to start talk, stop talking. <laughs> Oh, that was great. My listeners know that I have faith. I've mentioned it on several episodes. So this is good. I, we could have could talk for two hours on that topic, but we have to get to photobiomodulation. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll transition just a little bit here. So you mentioned that for many of your patients um, who are getting HBOT, you set time in the schedule for red light therapy. So how does that work? Are they doing red light therapy after? Um, doing it kind of depends. Most of the time it's doing it after. Yeah. Um, sometimes we do it before it's kind of patient flow. And I don't really think that the research stratifies either way. One or I the can, other. Yeah. Yeah. I can theorize either way and argue strongly for both ways. Um, so ultimately sometimes it comes down to patient flow. Um, and it, it just, it, it, it just kind of depends. So well, tell, yeah. Tell me some of the benefits and why you incorporate that with your patients. I know when I met you, you had kind of told me about your clinic and we yeah. had looked into getting a similar red light therapy panel, which we finally have. I got to get it set up on the right circuit now, but yeah, eventually we'll get this, yeah. this sucker up and running. Um, but tell our listeners what red light therapy is, kind of also okay. known as photobiomodulation, um, and how this has helped your patients. Yeah. So going back to my PhD work on photobiomodulation, I've always yeah, been yeah. in the interest and also understanding that helotherapy, which is sunlight therapy going out in the sun, has been done all the way into the time of Socrates. I mean, it's you go all the way back and, you know, we would take people and we know like people with psoriasis and getting yeah. out in the sun and we use UV lamps and things of that nature, that there's huge healing capabilities. And then the things got turned me on to it more so when I did uh, PhD research under Dr. George Einstein. And so we were going to have a prayer room in our, in our office. And I, it just takes me back to the beginning of the zinc spark and, 
God says, let there be light in the very beginning. So let there be light and light is healing and light is yeah. energy. Yeah. And just like, you know, plants grow when they had the proper soil, when they had the proper water and they had the proper sunlight. In the same way, our bodies tell me who feels more miserable when they're on a beach with their feet grounding on the earth by the negative ions blowing off the winds uh, of the ocean and then standing in the sun. You know, just about everybody feels better then, right? And so you, you think about light therapy and being in Michigan and the latitude we live at, we don't quite get the UV light that we need um, for activation of vitamin D and things of that nature. But that's where it started is, is we're going to have a prayer room. I'm like, if we're going to have a prayer room, why don't we put a red light in there and hit the red light therapy in there and just add a benefit to our patients because it increases. Uh, so if you think of our mitochondria, so going back to the very yes, beginning, yes, energy, yep. right? So if you think about mitochondria, mitochondria, mitochondria have inside them what are called cytochromes. Cyto for cell, chrome for light. And we can stimulate in the lab, which we've done with research, of stimulate mitochondrial function with light therapy. And so it will absorb that light. So there's, there's studies knowing that um, with regards to red blood cells, when they get exposed to light, um, it will bind to those red cells and it will change, create a conformational change to the hemoglobin, delivering more oxygen to the tissues which is why people will get tissue increased tissue oxygenation when they do like ultraviolet blood irradiation uh, where they're having their blood exposed to UV light. Um, so going back to where now the red light panels aren't a UV light, it's a different spectrum of light, but it stimulates the mitochondria, which is going to increase your energy output. So when I have people go in there, um, it's also for some of my patients with the chronic wound healing, but you can look at it from the same thing that there are tons of research articles on red light therapy, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, ozone therapy. And some people are like, okay, it's another panacea, but it's only a panacea because it's working with the foundational principles of health and healing, working at the level of the cell, which is why it works so well for so many different things that you have to overcome that hump of having a deficiency of energy currency in our body, make it rain, if you will, with money, right? Of making more ATP in the body. Um, and so the red light therapy, you'll see it from neurodegenerative diseases, which we've got people, I have one lady with Lewy body dementia that halluc was hallucinating all the time, uh, was having confabulations, could barely speak, was mumbling, very stupid, uh, gate where, a uh, uh, steep gate leaning over shuffled walking. Um, you couldn't hear her. You could listen like right up to her and just barely hear her mumble. By the mm -hmm. end of doing 40 sessions, she was no longer hallucinating. She recognized her husband. We could hear her across the clinic wow. uh, coming in saying, I love you guys. You guys changed my life. And, wow. but she, you know, she has red light therapy at home. She has a, was that like red light therapy on her head or was she, she was, was she doing full body, full body, full body, okay. full body. Yep. Full body. Yep. and there are other red light therapies that you could do that will do, uh, intracranial penetration and things like that. So there are different modalities and devices that you can get. We have a full panel, full body one. We have people just kind of turn over like a pancake, stand on one side for five minutes, flip on the other side. There is the law of diminishing returns. I know we do live in a world of more is better type mentality, but there is a mitochondrial decline after about 20 minutes. So there's so a no peak. more than 20 minutes. Sure. No, no more than 20 minutes. Yeah. Yep. So, okay. uh, but we kind of keep it 10 to 15 minute type sins uh, to get keep people moving in and moving out. And also again, it is a prayer room. So we have a wall where people can write little post-its of gratitude or whatever yeah. prayer requests and all that in that room as well. And yeah. then we just have music pumping in it, we have fun music playing all the time. And sometimes our staff and our team is dancing everywhere when I'm inside of a room and I hear people cackling and laughing. And <laughs> I, look, I look at the person, I said, it's normal here for our team like this. So, <laughs> so you know. <laughs> um, so but, what's, the yeah, so that's, what's the frequency like uh, for someone who does want to use red light therapy? Is that like a once a week thing? I mean, obviously if they have an acute injury, they could come in probably more regular yeah, you can that, do it you can yeah. you can do it daily, daily or, if you're yep. dealing with an acute injury type thing um you can um and, and also you know uh backing up the other things that it helps with is it helps with the elastin and you know your skin your collagen production yep. of your yep. skin uh some people's age spots are going away things like that but again it's all about providing the right energy so your cells have the ability to heal so typically we have people come in if they're doing something active and it's uh, based off of scheduling. So sometimes we'll have people come in daily for a period of time or three times a week for a, a 10 minute session, that type of thing. 
Awesome. So, but again, it's the dose and frequency changes based off of a person's issue. So I had a patient that, um, sometimes I, I jokingly say, are you kidding me? Cause sometimes I want to call her Job because there's just like one thing after another, but man, this person's <laughs> faith is tested, tested strong tested, yeah. and it's going to be a strong story for other people at, at one point, but, uh, end up falling, end up having, getting a cervical fusion in her neck and to try to help the bone healing with that. Um, I would turn off the, um, infrared because that will create a heat but she just had the plate put in so i didn't want to heat up the plates so i was just like let's just use the red light for this for two first two weeks mm -hmm. help the mitochondria help decrease tissue or help increase tissue healing decrease the swelling and stuff of that nature and just facilitate as much healing and then we'll go a little bit deeper after the acute phase is over here um so then we started to use the because sure. you can use just red light or you can use it with that and infrared so you have different spectrums of light energy being entered into the body. Um, just like how I asked with HBOT, any side effects or caveats with the red light therapy? Um, with regards to the red light therapy. I mean, if they um, had a skin cancer, like an active skin cancer. Yeah. So you know, on the, I would say that would be a contraindication probably. Yeah. So, and also increasing um, delivery of nutrients to a certain cancer and, and things of that nature. So um, like I, I did not recommend uh, using red light therapy for a patient that I had a, a diffuse B cell lymphoma that was on the face. Sure. Um, did not recommend using it there. Yep. More of a precaution, more theoretical, but I'm like, I don't want to do anything that could be a potential. If right. I have hard evidence that it's a no, then perfect. But if yeah. it's, if not, then let's not, let's not increase risk factors if we don't need to. Well, in pregnancy being that I'm currently pregnant, yes. <laughs> and I was so, so excited to get this red light therapy. I guess it's not a bet, it's a panel, but I know I can't use it. I mean, I could technically use red light therapy on my face, but just not that on or, that. Or your back, on the backside back, too. Yep, but you just know, not it's on. Not gonna, it's not going to penetrate that deep, deep into issues for, from that aspect, in my opinion, sure. Uh, sure. to go through your spine and the four inches of muscle that you have in that lower aspect and stuff. So Sure, great. Okay, how do I wrap this up as we as we wrap up the show? I guess I want to ask, like, what advice do you have for patients or providers who really want to integrate, like, as you are integrating faith with these cutting edge medical therapies? Like, how do patients and providers do that? And I mean, obviously, you're doing it well <laughs> in your practice, but do you have any advice for for patients or providers who are excited about this and, and yeah, they're wanting to integrate both? Um for providers and stuff is one, let go of the imposter syndrome and just embrace who you are and what you're all about. And you're going to attract your tribe of people that want what you have to offer and just being true and congruent with who you are and what you're about yes. and not shy away from that. And that's the biggest thing. And that's, that's a hurdle and a thing I have to overcome. And I openly talk about it. I mean, it's, I went into hiding and I deleted all my social media to get into medicine because I had this big following and I was doing YouTube videos and all this stuff. And I was like, well, some of this is kind of in the face of traditional medicine. So I deleted everything. So then when people yeah. are looking me up for my residency interviews that they're looking at this 36 year old, 40 year old guy going, Oh, look at him. We, you know, look at this video. No, we're not bringing this guy in. He's going to be disrupting. And mm -hmm. I wasn't there for, to medicine to disrupt it. I was there in medicine to master what they are teaching and what they're doing. And how do I integrate and take the best of all worlds yes. find to help facilitate healing? So I don't think everybody needs to stop what they're doing and go back to school. But if you feel called to do it, listen to it and do it. I don't regret one day of it. Well, was it hard? Was it challenging? Yeah. Was I on my knees at times? Yeah. I almost quit med school with six months left and I almost quit residence with six months left. Um, both completely different situations. Sure. Uh, one was I had $2.17 left in med school. And then the other one was I was just sick of the uh, um, lack of or the lack of compassion and the more of compassion fatigue that people were having mm -hmm. and casting judgment on people because they're addicted to heroin or meth, but not knowing their story, not finding out about them. How did they get there? You know, everybody has a different story. Um, and so how do we use that to help other people? Um, yes. And ultimately, when it comes to that for um, providers, again, be who you are, hone in what you are, continue to learn. Don't think that you know everything. Um, I have my limitations. I know a lot and I study a lot, but it's, again, that's my passion. When I was interviewed for residency, I literally, for a hobby, I, I read. I read medical journals. I read studies. I, it's what I'm interested in. 
So it, it wasn't like, oh, this guy is just giving us these canned answers. No, that's literally what I do. You can ask my family. If I'm not hanging out with my family and doing outdoor activities and exercising and doing fun stuff, then I'm studying and reading. That's what I do. So just be passionate about what you do when it comes to people in general. I recommend that people do study. I do. I love it when my patients come in. Most doctors hate it when people say, oh, I was researching on Google. I love it because then I can answer and sometimes I learn things. Um, so being open-minded from that aspect, but I think people should understand what's going on. So I spend a lot of time educating my people uh, that I get to work with that of how do you read your blood work? This is what this means. Don't just say it's normal and you're okay. I want you to know where you're truly at. Yeah. Um, because again, it's the years of dysfunction that lead to disease and pathology. So I want to let them know where they are in that spectrum, whether they're optimized or they're not. But also integrating their faith in that aspect is you have to understand your why. You know, understanding your why is is principle. Why do you care? Why do you want to be healthy? And sticking to that. Again, it's not about you. It's about you fulfilling the purpose and being the vessel that you were created to be and owning that for something yeah. bigger than yourself. And that is, and God will use you and God can use anybody at any time, you know, and it's just, can you be most purposeful? Can you do it most energetically? Wake up every day thriving and ready just to go out and do what you want to do. Um, and do what you're passionate about with the gifts and skills that you have. And I just truly believe at the fundamental level, no one's going to go into church on Sunday and spray paint the walls and turn the trash can upside down and, you know, sit there and walk in and, and, and do all those things. They're just not going to do that. Right. But, you know, the church is us as people. It's the, it's the body of people working together, you know, not Sunday morning. I mean, we do have to have a light group to be there and recharge with people. I get that understanding of it, but you know, if Jesus only hung around people like him, then there wouldn't be any influence. So we have to influence beyond ourselves and we have to get out of our comfort zones. We have to understand our worth and our worth comes from him, not from external and other people's expectations. So let go of other people's expectations, hone in and own in what you are and what you're created to be and go in that purposeful health journey uh, towards health and healing so that you could better fulfill your purpose that you're created to do. I love saying mic drop. Yes, that was great. Beautiful. Love it. I forgot to ask about probonics though. So now I have to go back to that. <laughs> can you can you quickly, as we wrap up the show again, can you quickly tell us about that? Probi it's a probiotic, correct? Yeah. So that you formulated. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I've been working with Humarian um, after chief medical officer and formulator and digging into the research on gastrointestinal health. Years ago, I quit giving uh, probiotics because I was like, they're not encapsulated. They're going to get killed off in the stomach acid. Um, so why stomach acid is our first line of defense against bacteria. It's going to kill everything. So realizing, though, that dead bacteria do have some benefit, benefits with, with the what are called bacterial cell lysates, which is the innards, if you will. If you squeeze a grape, it releases all its contents on the inside. So there were differences at the, in the research studies, but I was just like, we're not really growing these populations. And so long story short, we were able to uh, use some technologies to be able to make the first liquid probiotic that was out there that did not need to be refrigerated because the bacteria go into what we call a VBNC, which is viable, non-culturable uh, bacteria, basically. Um, so uh, the, this they're viable, they're alive, they're metabolically active, they're in hibernation, so to speak. They're not replicating. So, but when they hit the small intestine is when they start to become activated. And then mainly when they hit the large intestine, depending upon the strain based off of the environment. And so we were able to show 10 times more than the leading brand physician brand, uh, nutraceutical product that was out there for probiotics at that time, we were able to show 10 times more survivability past the stomach with a 10th of the amount that they were using, which was great. So that's really probonics. And so um, it, it's, it's formulated to be a general spectrum, but we also have it for infants and toddlers because they're more bifidobacterium until about the age of eight or nine. And then it switches more from a bifidobacterium to lactobacillus. And then uh, we have one more for UTIs and chronic yeast infections for women. Um, so there's a women's formula. In general, I recommend women that don't have chronic UTIs and candida issues that they just use the general adult formula. We do have it now in an encapsulated formula as well. Um, but what I'm most excited about is our most latest product that we have out. And I have a whole line of these things that is our using our IGY technology. We've been working on this since probably 2014. I wondered uh, what that was when I was trying to, when I was stumbling over your bio there. Yeah. What, yeah. Explain what that so is. Yeah. The IGY technology is think about breast milk. 
breast milk provides passive immunity to a baby when they're when they're breastfeeding. Why? Because a baby can't really mount an immune response until six months where they're starting to use B cells and make antibodies, sure. right? Yeah. So the breast milk have antibodies that are generalized antibodies that are go into the breast milk, go into the digestive system of the baby, and it binds onto it like a magnet and then carries it through the digestive system so it doesn't create pathology in the baby. That's passive immunity, right? So same thing, we, in a broad spectrum, we have very specific targeted therapies that we're able to do. And so uh, we inoculate the chickens and we inoculate them with whatever antigen that we want, which is a foreign substance. And then we highly concentrate that, put that into a capsule. IGY is very similar to IgG, which is an immunoglobulin yep. human. Yep, that's what, we sell lots F of that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't have an FC portion, so it doesn't activate the immune system. It's a passive immunity in the GI system that will bind up whatever pathogen and carry it through the body without any problem. So our first product, I'm just so excited because we have a whole line of these things. Uh, so I just, I'm so excited. But the first one coming <laughs> out is, is called SmileGuard. So we actually use it. So you, you think about, so I trained in a facility in Kalamazoo, Michigan, Western Michigan School of Medicine. I worked with people that were homeless, people that were living in the streets um, in, in, at the missions. And a lot of these people didn't have great nutritious food. They didn't have teeth to chew uh, the food to get the nutrients that they needed. So here I am seeing all these micronutrient deficiencies, vitamin A deficiencies, things that we learn in med school that you're never going to see except in third world countries. Well, I'm telling you, they live in a third world country. Right. So it all starts with oral health at the beginning, from the moment that we start chewing food and breaking it down into the micronutrients and the things that we need for our body to thrive. So we have our product called SmileGuard. SmileGuard, the first thing that it does is we isolated certain enzymes that we know with strep mutans that causes cavities when exposed to sugar and binds to your teeth, creates this acid that eats away at the enamel. So, um, Back when I was in grade school, the dental hygienist would have you chew this little pink tablet and it'll look at your, your teeth to see if you have strep mutans on there. Then you would brush to see if you get rid of it and if you're brushing properly, right? So we had this whole study that was done in 2018 with a researcher um, over in Asia. And uh, we've been able to show that uh, the before and afters, that it really literally will bind to the strep mutans and carry it down the digestive system and swallow it and it goes out without any problem. But we also made it against P. gingivalis. Uh, Porphyromas gingivalis is a gingivitis, is a, affects 50% of the population worldwide. Gingivitis is what makes your uh, inflammation at your gum lines. You can start to get um, what people will call, um, uh, I just- Periodontal disease? I don't know. Yeah, periodontal disease, but because you're, you're getting these plaques and the plaques will create this biofilm. So they'll do scraping and get rid of it. But we've been able to show that we significantly decreased the percentage of P. gingivalis, even with the scrapings um, a month later by using these lozenges that will bind the P. gingivalis and carry it throughout the body. And then the cool yeah, thing cool. also, yeah, yeah it, it's just awesome. So, and we got before and after showing th that changes on probing depths. So we got the research to back everything, which is just phenomenal. I love it. Um, so that's our first product, but P. gingivalis is also linked to cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, they found it in Alzheimer's plaques and also rheumatoid arthritis and because of molecular mimicry. So people sure. talk about leaky gut and intestinal permeability, but we also have leaky gums. So that's pretty cool. Um, so then we also have a product for H. pylori that will bind up. It'll put mittens on H. pylori, basically, so it can't bind to our intestines, um, into our stomach lining and, and create stomach ulcers. Uh, we also have it against candida and we also have it against LPS. So some people are starting yeah. to learn about LPS. I've been yep. studying it a lot since 2012 and 13. Um, LPS is a huge trigger. We use it in research studies to trigger uh, autoimmune. Um, it's what pe makes people septic when they are in uh, get septic and, and they basically have a bacterial infection and their blood pressure drops, heart rate's going up, and they start to crash and go on life support because they have a massive blood-borne yeah. infection. So LPS does that. So you got tons of LPS in the gut. So there's certain testings uh, like Cyrex or KBMO. They all are testing for antibodies to LPS, but there's no options for it. People are taking colostrum, but there's nothing targeted. So Stephanie, I mean, we can, it's like a magnet, it just <laughs> binds to it and it binds tighter than our own IgG. So it neutralizes it like a, and binds to it like a magnet and carries it through the digestive system. So it no longer is acting as a trigger. So you're lessening that burden on the person. And each person has a different level of burden, just like we all have a level of uh, toxicity. We all have a bucket and people's buckets are different sizes and people can tolerate it. So just like people with alcohol tolerance, not advocating drinking alcohol, but 
You know, if I have two drinks, I'm three sheets to a win, but I got a buddy that's 120 pounds soaking wet that could drink a case of beer and be fine. <laughs> you know, his metabolism is a little Everybody's bit different. Everybody's a little different. Yeah. Exactly. So as different as we look on the outside, we're that different on the inside. So these are all things. And so I have a pipeline. My whole goal is to make this rescue remedy because Stephanie, there are 3 million people that die every year from um, infectious diarrhea all over the world. So my goal is to make a rescue remedy of all the things that are infectious diarrhea and put that out there. So th that's, we've got that in the pipeline. Um, wow. And yeah. bought, bought in the United States, we'll go to missions work in third world countries to help uh, solve diarrhea issues that people don't need to die from Giardia and things of that nature, just because they don't have the medication. Amazing. Yeah. Using your background anyway. to help the masses. No. So where yeah. do listeners learn about pro I want to ask where listeners can find you, but also yeah. where do they learn about probonics and this IGY technology, like your supplement yeah. line? Where do listeners yeah, find that? So people can go to humarian.com. Um, so humarian.com is our main website for all things with regards to the probiotics and uh, probiotics. And there's lots of education on there that I've done. Um, in addition to now we're launching the IGY products that will be on there as well. Um, and then when it comes to me personally, if they just go to bentleymd.com, they can connect with me on social media. Just recently started up my Instagram uh, channel uh, back when we first met. I was like, all right, <laughs> I need to get out of my comfort zone. I need to not worry about it and just be me. So, uh, so that's- Well, there's uh, about a hundred uh, snippets from this interview you can repurpose for your <laughs> Instagram if you want. <laughs> well, thank you for that. So, yeah. So I just, I just truly appreciate the opportunity of being on here and uh, just being able to share my heart and be me. And I love what you do. I appreciate you integrating your faith into your practice and caring for people from this 30,000 foot view, but also being able to narrow in and help people have uh, this longevity and not just longevity, but their vitality in that timeline that they're here. So yeah, we're living longer, but is your life more purposeful? Are you able to mm -hmm. play with it? I mean, I want to be the great grandparent that's kicking a soccer ball and playing ball with my great grandkids, you know, and that's- You want I a health see. span, not just a lifespan. Exactly. Yes. We want yeah. that. We want that healthy lifespan of vitality and longevity, not just living longer on a life support. You have so much on your plate. Obviously you're using all your gifts. You are clearly, yes, heeding your calling here. You also have another book coming out. So tell our listeners <laughs> about that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I really, so my, my main book that I love is Vessels That Thrive, Choosing a Lifestyle of Health, Healing, and Faith. And what's funny about that book is in the very back, I wrote, I, you know, I was, you know, about the author and I write about why I don't go into medicine. I kid you not, I published that book. And, like, and then you went into medicine. <laughs> I, like literally, like weeks later, I'm going into medicine. I My matriculation started right after the publication of that book. And I'm like, God, you are funny. And so <laughs> now having this journey of going through medicine for 10 years, um, there's so much more I want to integrate into Vessels That Thrive. So we do have a second edition that I'm in the works of that, of integrating some of these stories that I've been able to experience, uh, why I wanted to quit with six months left of residency and share some of those star stories because there's some heart tugging stories that just really make you contemplate contemplate life and purpose and loving and caring and compassion. Um, so, but in between there, I, as I said earlier, I finished the five day fast and I was just massively inspired. I woke up at like 3 AM and God just laid on my heart and, you know, uh, wrote a book called living your why a journey towards purposeful health. Uh, it's currently in editing. It's a short book able to be read in probably 90 minutes but it's seven chapters long, uh, helping people walk through that journey with, with reflection questions, uh, talking about scriptures, sharing some stories and some quick insights without all the in-depth stuff, but really for people that are ready to get inspired, they're ready for that get-go. Um, Sounds and like just, something uh, every patient should read before they get started, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> down, yeah, yeah. And, and narrow it down just to help them kind of get their mind shifted towards it's not about me it's about living for something bigger than myself and so um, if people go to bentleymd.com there'll be a place that they could sign up i'm going to give away a digital copy for the first 50 people that sign up and also they'll get 30 days of uh, uh, prayer and devotion um, that they'll be able to get downloadable when the book comes out i'm not quite sure because like i said it's still in editing right now uh, but super excited for it because I think it'll just help people in that pathway, but they could connect with me, sign up on there. They'll get the, get an email of like, thank you for signing up. And we'll send them that as soon as editing is done. And we've got all the little logistics things that we have to do in the background. 
Uh, but again, on at BentleyMD.com, they could find everything, Vitalis Health, Humarian, yep. uh, the red light therapy that we partner with, um, all those different things. So uh, there's stuff on red light therapy. I'm starting the blog on there. So just starting all those things. Um, I've got tons of content that I've created in the past that uh, we'll start posting on there um, for people that like what I have to say and that we can connect that um, have shared minds like you and I. So with all this going on, I have two final questions. You opened with your story of pain. So obviously you have the capacity to do a lot right now. <laughs> so how is your pain? How is your health? Flash forward, like where are you at now? <laughs> I'm doing incredible. Um, I feel really, really good. Um, I practice what I preach. My I lived that life of, you know, running around with a chicken with the head cut off. So why I am pretty diverse in the things that I'm providing and doing, I'm very protective of my time. Mm -hmm. And my team is very protective of my time. So, you know, we're a capacity office for me acting as people's primary, that type of thing. I still will see people on an acute health aspect of it, but we're pretty booked up uh, for those appointments. But, and my heart goes out because I want to help people, but the more doctors I can help, then the more people that I can help. Sure. So sure. that's the next phase is really going towards that. And so I have to continue to be at peak performance to do that. So I've still never had a spinal surgery. I don't have radicular pain into my low into my lower legs and functioning well. So thank you, um, God. Yes, that's great. Yeah, that's my good. spine looks horrible on an MRI, but I feel great. So wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Final question. Top longevity tip. If you had to pick one, what's your top longevity tip? Know your why. Your why is what your why is what drives you every morning to jump up out of bed and to live your purpose. So that is it because you can have longevity, but if you don't have it without vitality and you don't have vitality without health and you don't get your health and true calling of health and healing until you understand your purpose, uh, which is established with your why. Why do you care? Why do you want to be better? Love it. No one has shared that. And I've asked a couple hundred people that question. So unique, great answer. Uh, thank you so much today for coming on the show and just sharing all your experiences and kind of as we talked about it at the beginning, explaining, I'm losing my voice here, explaining how we don't want to be at that energy deficit, right? And then giving us strategies to really help support our mitochondria. You gave so many strategies today. So I hope listeners connect with you. I'm looking forward to reading your book. This was just amazing. Thank you for sharing your faith and being bold. And, you know, I guess really just going back and listening to God as to what you needed to do, the path you needed to take. And now you're sharing that with others. So this is beautiful. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. And God bless you. I'm well enough because I just feel, I feel my heart is full. So thank you for what you do. I appreciate uh, everything that you do. So thank you. And God bless you and welcome a, a new baby into your family. It's beautiful. Oh, thank you. All right. You have a great day. <laughs> it's like, where's the stop button?